Deep in the heart of Old Bridge County stood Silverwood Forest, an expanse of ancient trees and rolling undergrowth that had once been a vibrant habitat for countless creatures. Over the decades, however, the forest lost many of its native species, largely due to deforestation and human interference. By the early 2000s, it had become an ecological shell of its former self, lacking the rich biodiversity it once boasted. Wildlife officials noticed dwindling bird calls and a visible absence of smaller animals that had once thrived beneath the leafy canopy. Many believed Silverwood was destined for perpetual decline. Then came a remarkable idea from a team of scientists and ecologists based at the Braxton Environmental Institute. Led by Dr. Harriet Morrison, the group devised an unorthodox plan to introduce a massive population of crabs, millions of them, into sections of the forest. Their hypothesis rested on years of studying coastal regions where land crabs helped aerate the soil, cleaned up decaying vegetation, and maintained crucial ecological balances. Though crabs in a forest might have sounded bizarre, Dr. Morrison believed that if properly managed, these crustaceans could restore the soil's nutrients and encourage a resurgence of native flora and fauna. When the plan was first proposed, it was met with skepticism and even ridicule. Crabs in a forest? Local newspapers asked. What nonsense! Many residents feared that flooding the woods with pincered creatures would upset the delicate environment further or result in some nuisance crab invasion scenario. Nevertheless, after extensive planning, regulatory reviews, and smaller pilot trials in controlled sections of the forest, the project finally began in earnest. Over the course of six months, trucks delivered container after container of bright red forest crabs to carefully selected release points in Silverwood's western reaches. This species, nicknamed Scarlet Marsh Crabs by the team, was known to be hardy, adaptable, and surprisingly good at traveling far from water sources. Researchers outfitted hundreds of them with tiny tracking tags to monitor their spread, survival rates, and migration patterns. Many experts doubted the crabs would last through the colder winter months, let alone transform the forest as Dr. Morrison predicted. Still, the science team pressed forward. To them, the carefully gathered evidence indicated a strong possibility that the crustaceans could fill certain ecological gaps left by extinct or extirpated species. In the weeks following the release, there was minimal visible change. Cameras placed throughout the woods captured images of the crabs crawling over logs, foraging for decaying plant matter, and burrowing shallow holes beneath tree roots. Locals who ventured near the area occasionally caught glimpses of scuttling red shells amid the foliage, but no sensational meltdown occurred. No horror stories of unstoppable crustaceans marching into backyards, the project attracted a few curious onlookers, though. Students from Braxton University's biology club took to calling it the strangest experiment since the moon landing, with playful exaggeration. As the first year passed, Dr. Morrison's team noticed slow but measurable improvements in soil composition. Rich pockets of nutrients began to form in areas where the crabs had dug, mixing oxygen into layers that had long been compacted. Some new plants sprouted more vigorously, the presence of the crabs also seemed to discourage overgrowth of certain invasive weeds as the creatures scoured the forest floor for sustenance. Even so, it was too early to declare victory. Many in the scientific community withheld judgment, pointing out that some species thrive temporarily in new habitats only to crash later. Still, the crabs persisted. By the end of year two, more camera traps were installed to gather better data. The scientists documented countless clips of the scarlet marsh crabs turning over leaf litter, nibbling on small fungus clusters, and occasionally sparring with one another. Interestingly, the introduction of the crabs also appeared to influence local predators, as foxes and raccoons, which had previously been scarce, reappeared to feed on the new abundance of crustaceans. With them came owls and hawks. The forest's old symphony of hoots, chirps, and rustling leaves seemed to inch back toward life. At the close of year three, Dr. Morrison described a phenomenon she called natural synergy. The crabs, by devouring decaying plant matter and aerating the soil, allowed native seedlings to take hold again. This, in turn, drew deer herds to graze on the young grasses, 
tiny amphibians found new breeding grounds among the damp crab burrows, the entire ecosystem was entering a new phase of self-maintenance. She delivered a talk at a major ecology conference where she revealed striking images of fox dens adjacent to crab-rich areas, healthy new undergrowth, and even the re-emergence of threatened fern species believed to have vanished from Silverwood decades ago. In year four, debate flared anew when a spate of local news segments portrayed the forest's crab boom. Some camera footage circulated online showing segments of forest floor appearing as though they were alive, covered in bright red shells creeping in all directions, reminiscent of dramatic crab migrations on remote islands. A few alarmist voices warned that this had to be a disastrous sign. Yet the data from Dr. Morrison's team pointed to a self-regulating balance. The older crabs died off or were preyed upon, returning nutrients to the forest floor, while younger generations continued to fill the ecological niche. The overall population, while enormous compared to anywhere else on the mainland, remained relatively stable. By the time the fifth anniversary of the project arrived, anticipation hovered over the research community. Everyone wondered, would the system remain stable, flourish, or collapse from unforeseen pressures? The scientists decided to do an extensive field survey, collecting data from more than 100 camera traps scattered across the forest. Dr. Morrison herself led a press conference, inviting local media and some skeptics from other institutions to see the results. Among the crowd of attendees was Dr. Omar Salazar, a vocal critic who once described the experiment as borderline madness. He stood next to a group of younger graduate students, arms folded and eyebrows raised. The presentation began with basic statistics. Soil quality had improved by an average of 40% across the surveyed zones, with higher levels of essential nutrients. A montage of camera trap highlights played on a large screen. Foxes chasing crabs, deer grazing, rabbits browsing on revitalized shrubs. Applause rippled through the room, but no one was quite prepared for the final segment of footage. We retrieved this video just three nights ago, Dr. Morrison announced. It illustrates the remarkable synergy that's forming at the heart of Silverwood. The screen showed a moonlit clearing. Thousands upon thousands of crabs moved in unison, clacking their claws softly over the leaf litter. From the sidelines, a small group of young elk cautiously entered the clearing, stepping among the scuttling red shells without aggression or panic. The crabs parted smoothly around the elk as though guided by some unspoken truth. Then, from the left side of the frame, a mother fox and her kits trotted into view. An entire predator family living comfortably side by side with the crabs they consumed as part of their diet. The synergy left viewers breathless. There was no frenzied chase, no panic. The animals navigated each other with calm familiarity, part of a balanced system. You could hear audible gasps and a few hushed exclamations. Dr. Salazar leaned forward, eyes riveted. When the footage ended, he was among the first to applaud. During the final Q&A, local journalist Shannon Pierce asked the obvious question. How did this improbable partnership succeed against so many doubts? Dr. Morrison's response was as humble as it was triumphant. We took a risk. We studied the data, recognized an opening in the ecosystem, and hypothesized that these crabs could fill roles lost to human disruption. Nature did the rest. Once given the space and proper conditions, life knows how to adapt and thrive in ways we can hardly predict. That evening, the group ventured into Silverwood's western portion. With the late summer air still warm, the forest echoed with new energy. They walked carefully, shining soft flashlights on the forest floor, where roving squads of red crabs gleamed in the beams. Occasionally, a rustle sounded overhead as an owl flew past. Dr. Salazar, normally tight-lipped, turned to doctor. Morrison and admitted, I was wrong. This is, well, it's breathtaking. She smiled in gratitude. Over the following weeks, word of Silverwood's crab miracle made headlines nationwide. Conservationists took heart, seeing it as a sign that with creative thinking and careful planning, humanity might repair some of the ecological damage done over centuries. The forest was, of course, still a work in progress, but it stood as a living testament that outlandish solutions could sometimes revitalize devastated habitats. 
Today, five years after millions of crabs first crawled across the threshold into Silverwood, the forest teems with life. New bird calls ring out each morning, deer tracks wind through the undergrowth, and the occasional startled hiker might find a bright red claw waving at them from behind a fallen log. Although nature's mysteries remain vast and unpredictable, the scientists behind the project have proven one inspiring truth. When we trust the resilience of the natural world and help restore its missing pieces, incredible things can happen.